Hello, everyone. Welcome to Developmental Psychology, DEP 2004. I am Dr. Rivera. Now, a type of research that's really important in developmental psychology are longitudinal studies. In a longitudinal study, what happens is I'm going to find usually some children. It doesn't always have to be children. They could be adults. But usually I'll find some children and I'll run a few tests on them or ask them to fill out some surveys or something along those lines. I'll observe them and get some data from them. And then I'll allow five years to go by, 10 years to go by, or sometimes uh, some really good longitudinal studies will follow them. And every two years, they will refine the children and study them again to see how they have changed. Right. And so what I'm doing now is that gives me the ability to compare the same group of people from when they were children to when they were adults. Why do we want to do something like this? Well, if you don't do longitudinal research, you don't really know if the changes that the child is going through have anything to do with actually getting older as opposed to just being part of that town or uh, part of that country or part of that time, right? People who were born in the 50s are rather different than people who were born in the 80s, let's say. And some of the differences between people born in the 50s and people born in the 80s is their age, right? People who were born in their 50s today are much more mature. They're older than people who were born in the 80s. Um, and so, yeah, it, a lot of the changes are going to be due just to maturation, just to the fact that they are grown, that they are at different ages. But not all of them. Some of them are going to have to do, some of the differences that we're going to find are going to have to do with the fact that people in the 50s were born in the 50s and raised in the 60s. And people from the 80s were born in the 80s and raised in the 90s. And the differences in culture just in the time periods um, are going to give us some kind of false data. But if I follow the same group of children over years, then I know that it has nothing to do with culture. Uh, the changes, I should say, have nothing to do with culture. Um, they only have to do with age because they are the same people. Now, the problem with longitudinal studies is that they're very expensive because you have to find your sample, which isn't always easy anyway. And then you have to refine them later on. Um, and, you know, every year that passes by, every day that passes by, means that it's going to be a little bit harder to find all of the people in in your original study. Some of them move, some of them go to different countries. Some of them just say, no, I don't want to. Yeah, I know I did that when I was 10. I don't want to tell you about my life now. Um, and so they just drop from the study. Um, so longitudinal studies are difficult because they are expensive. In a study that I was reading not too long ago, um, they did a longitudinal study, but it was they were researchers from a university. They didn't really have that much money. Um, and so what they did was what they did the initial study, and then they just waited a few years and started going through public records, and they determined who had died and who had not died. All of the subjects were older people in this um, study. And so that is a kind of, kind of like a little loophole there. So you don't have to spend as much money. Um, public records can sometimes allow you to do a longitudinal study without having to literally find everybody. But usually most things that people study in longitudinal research, you have to go find them again. So they tend to be rather expensive. Now. Um, Another way to determine differences in ages is what we call cross-sectional research. And this is like the normal kind of research. I have some people who are children, 
maybe some people who are teenagers or adults, some people who are older. Um, and then I compare the children to the adults or the teenagers to the much older people or whatever. Um, this is a cross-sectional, right? It's a cross-section of the population. That's what I'm trying to do here. Get a good sample from the population and just compare the ones to the others. Now, I kind of already mentioned the cohort effect, um, which is sometimes the differences between groups has nothing to do with maturation. It's not that you got older, is that you're just different people from different cultures or different times. Um, the classic example is people's feelings to gay marriage. If I go find 115 year olds and ask them about gay marriage, there's a good chance that very few of them are gonna tell me that they have a problem with gay marriage. On the other hand, if I go find much older people, if I find people in their 70s and 80s, and I ask them about how they feel about gay marriage, a lot of them are likely to say that they don't agree with it. Why does getting older mean that you get more bigoted or that you get more homophobic? Um, no, maturation has nothing to do with that. The difference there is almost entirely cultural, and specifically, it has to do with when you grew up. People who were born in the 40s or 50s, they were born into a culture that was very bigoted against gay people. But people who were born in the 2000s or in the 90s, um, they weren't born into that world. Uh, there was a lot more acceptance and a lot less bigotry. And so just by the chance that some people are born first and other people are born later, or that some people are born in one part of the country or the other, um, they are cohorts of one another. That's what the term is. The reason older people tend to have more bigoted views towards uh, gay individuals is because they're cohorts. They are part of the same time and the same culture, and that is why they have similarities in their beliefs, not because they're older. If I were to do a longitudinal study um, with this topic, what I'm going to find is that however you felt about gay marriage when you were 15, you probably are going to feel the exact same way when you're 20 or when you're 30 or 40. Um, yeah, some people do change, but for the most part, we're gonna find that there's very little change in that. Whereas when I do a cross-sectional research, it implies that there is a big difference between being much older and younger in terms of uh, their acceptance of this group or that group. <laughs> Now, if you really want to spend some money, you might want to do a cross-sequential research. Um, this is very difficult to do. It is very expensive um, because you need a bigger sample size and you have to follow the individuals over the years. So it's kind of like a combination of the two previous studies. So in a cross-sequential study, I have find a large group, some children, some teenagers maybe, some adults and some older adults, and then I study them. And then I go find them five years later, all of them. Now the baby is a, you know, maybe a seven-year-old. All the children are in their teens. Uh, all the adults are just slightly older now, um, maybe even like getting close to old age. And uh, the much older person um, is even, even more older, right? Maybe they went from 75 to 80. Um, and now I can not only compare the individuals to each other, like I might do in a cross-sectional study, but now I can also com compare them over time, like I might do in a longitudinal study. And um, this is going to give you a lot more detail in the different types of changes that occur. Um, as I mentioned if you're doing a cross-sequential research study, there's a good chance you work for a corporation or for the government. 
this takes a lot of money to do. Um, and if you're just a lowly researcher in a college, there's a good chance that this is going to be very time consuming and very difficult. Also, with cross-sequential and longitudinal studies, if your hypothesis is wrong, then you just wasted five years of your life um, and you have to go find something else to try to study. Obviously, you know, negative results are results. Uh, sometimes the answer is that there's no connection, um, but it can be very heartbreaking after you do so much research uh, over so long to not get the results that you thought you would get, it's very difficult. All right, one last type of research that is really important in developmental um, studies, and really in all studies, is what we call a meta-analysis. Sometimes there's this problem with studies, which is, um, you know, one researcher did a study on, let's say, coffee. How good is coffee for you? And that research found that coffee is bad for you. But then another researcher next year does a similar study, and they find that coffee is, in fact, good for you. And then another study comes up, and that one finds that coffee doesn't have an effect on your health. And then there's another study, and it, that study says that coffee is good for you during these situations, right? And so you go, wait a second. All of these studies say different things. What am I supposed to believe if one study says this and the other one says that? Well, then you go into the study, right? People who do a meta-analysis will go into the different studies and try to figure out, um, first of all, why some of the differences occurred. And it could be sample size. Sometimes if your sample size is too small, you'll get a very weird effect. Um, Sometimes it's the questions they asked. Sometimes it's the questions that they didn't ask, right? Um, and so, for example, st coffee is one of these topics. For a long time, people would do studies on coffee and they would get just crazy different answers. And one year, you would be watching TV and they tell you, a study came out, don't drink coffee anymore. And then the next year, a study came out, you should drink more coffee. And then eventually, researchers started to do meta-analyses, which means they went to the many studies that were done over the decade of, on coffee, and they just pulled out the data. And in pulling out the data, they uh, reorganized um, and they controlled for other variables. So for example, um, the main variable that turned out to be causing the problem um, in the data was smoking. A lot of people who drink coffee also smoke a lot. And so if I don't control for smoking, then it's going to look like people who drink coffee die younger. Um, but of course, it's not the coffee that's doing that. When you control for smoking, what do you find? That in fact, coffee is very good for you. It's like tea, it has nutrients and uh, other things that you know might affect your nerves a little bit more because it has way more caffeine. Um, but for the most part, the studies find that uh, coffee is good for you, and people who drink coffee tend to live a little longer. Um, but if you, if researchers hadn't gone in to do the meta-analysis, pull the data from each individual study and reanalyze it by and with controls, etc., then we would have never got into that point because. Like I mentioned, a lot of studies are very small because of money. And so one researcher does a study on 10 people, and then the other one is a survey on 100. And in the end, what ended up happening was we didn't have good data until we started to pull out all of these, uh, all of the data from the studies. And we got, you know, a sample of a thousand people, for example. And it was, much easier to do because you didn't have to find the people. The data had already been collected by the previous researchers. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. And remember that the best way to contact me is directly through Canvas. I hope to hear from you soon.